Hey everybody, it's Mr. X Ditch here and I'm back with another designer discourse video in which I take an hour or so to talk about the subject of cross stitch design with someone who's experienced in the field and this time around we've got the fantastic Cheryl McKinnon aka Tiny Modernist. She's a hugely popular designer over in Canada and we have an excellent conversation talking about her creative process talking about marketing, talking about what to do when you're not in the mood for the kind of work that you need to do, talking about Biscor news, the, the tensions between modern cross-stitch and the more traditional cross-stitch, and just everything in between, really. It's another fascinating conversation with lots of tips, and I know that in a recent Stitch of the Union survey over at X-Stitch magazine, Cheryl was voted the most popular designer that we've had. So, uh, yeah, I think you'll get a lot out of it. Cheryl was talking via her phone. The video's a little bit choppy sometimes at her end, but the sound is good. So just get yourself a cuppa, maybe get your stitching out, sit down and have a listen and hopefully you enjoy yourself. Thanks for your time. So how did you become Tony, do you like the fact as well? This is the fact that, like, there's a few people when I post things out to them, I've just got them set, and now you're forever, you will be Tony Modernist. Whenever I send you something, you'll know it's right. me. Yeah. Because of that typo. That's but, okay. but, but how did you come to be a cross stitch designer and all that? Um, well, let me first start with a funny story because the name Tiny Modernist uh, has been with me for a while, and um, I've actually been mistaken for tiny before from uh like a fedex person came to the door and he had a package and he looked at the package and then he looked at me <laughs> and he looked at the package and he said he said tiny <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> but, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take it sure yeah, <laughs> yeah. um but, but no the uh, the name actually uh comes originally from a little clothing design company that i had um when my my oldest daughter who's now 13 i'm gonna age myself a little bit um she was just a baby and I was fresh out of um, fashion design school, maybe a year out of school. And, uh, you know, I had a baby, I was home and I, as much as I loved my kids, I needed some kind of creative outlet. So um, I started making little girls dresses and selling them on Etsy, which in 2008 was, uh, it was the beginning of mm. 2008. Yeah, so it was relatively uh, smaller. Yeah, it was, it was, a, it wasn't saturated really like it is these days, but um, so I started this little company making girls dresses and around the same time I had, I had picked cross stitching up back. Um, I had picked it back up just as a hobby for myself. I hadn't stitched in ages, although I, I did um, when I was a teenager. So I picked it back up and I was just stitching other people's work. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, there's some lovely designs out there, but at the time there wasn't much I could find that was that really resonated with me, right? The sort of modern, bold, there was a few, you know, there was a few things here and there, but there wasn't a lot. Um, and so I thought, well, I could give myself, you know, I could give it a go, right? And just do some things for myself. And the first thing I, I chose to do were um, a set of chairs because at the time I was just, well, I still am, but I was really into modern furniture and, uh, you know, Herman Miller stuff and, mm. and Charles and Ray Eames. Like I just absolutely loved the mid-century modern um, furniture. And uh, I thought, well, wouldn't it be neat to have a little set of chairs to hang in my living room? So, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I just created these four little chairs. And I'll be honest, my first few goes at it uh, were pretty rough <laughs> when I look back now compared to my process. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing designing cross-stitch patterns. Um, you know, I was coming from a fashion design background. I had the technical skills with Illustrator and Creative Suite and this kind of thing. Mm. Um, so I, I designed for the first couple of years anyways in... Until 2012, so almost four years, I designed in Illustrator, okay. and I would use the snap to grid function, right. um, and I would just use color blocks and, and, and basically just freehand draw things in there using the snap to grid, um, and then I would manually add the symbols. And um, you know, at that point, I wasn't really putting up that many patterns, so it didn't it wasn't too critical. But um, at one point, I think 2012, I said I I really need to get some cross stitch software. Um, so that was why I moved over to, to Mac Stitch. And um, as far as I know, they are still the only mm. cross-stitch design software that works for Mac. Um, so anyways, was, I've been with them for... It was interesting that you said on your YouTube that you had to partition your laptop so that you've got a Windows side that you can use for yes. the other software that you use. Yes, I, I do. Now that is because... 
when I work for the UK magazines and some other magazines, um, they prefer the, um, the files to be in cross-stitch professional, like mm. XS Pro. Um, and so I actually got that. There is a Mac version, but according to, um, you know, according to the girls that I, that I talked to there, it's not as great. There's a lot of bugs and whatnot. So I opted to do the PC version, which is compatible for them. And um, yeah, so I have an iMac that I had to partition. And Google's wonderful for these kinds of things. Yeah. So I'm semi-technical, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, I just Googled it and I was able to partition it. I, you know, and really, I only run Windows when I'm using that particular program. Mm. Um, and then I switch it back. It has actually slowed it down a little bit. So I tend to work more on my laptop um, when I'm designing and then I'm more portable as well. But um, I do have the, the Windows and um, iOS running on my, my iMac. So um, did you have, so, you know, it depends. I, you know, you sort of have to be flexible. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, so um, do you have a prior skill set then from what you just said earlier about like, did you study kind of fashion and stuff like that? Yeah, I did. So I, I have a visual arts degree that I studied first uh, right out of high school. Um, so I have a bachelor's of fine arts. Um, and that I think was really the creative side. I didn't know where I wanted to take it, but I sort of just generalized there. And um, at that point, I didn't have a whole lot of computer skills. We're looking at sort of early 2000s. And then I went to um, uh, college in Vancouver. That was why I moved there. I did three years at fashion school there at a, at a, a college in um, Richmond, BC, which is just south of Vancouver. And that was really actually where I learned um, Illustrator, Photoshop, um, the, really the two main programs that I use now. Um, and not only for um, the designing, as I said at the beginning, but um, that's where I lay out all my, my patterns, all the um, graphics for social media promotion, um, you know, all my little, all my little charts and everything are all laid out in, in Illustrator. Um, I actually have Adobe um, uh, Professional as well, and that has a lot of editing capabilities, believe it or not. Right. Um, so the, the charts that come out of Mac Stitch, I export them as PDF, mm -hmm. um, and then I'll do some, some very basic editing. If it's for... Um, now I have two actually different types of, pro of uh, products. I have the PDFs that I sell on my website, and then I have the paper patterns that I wholesale to shops. Okay. Um, and so the, uh, the PDFs I'm able to export right away into a PDF, and they don't really need a whole lot of uh, touching up. I just um, put a header and some copyright information and stuff on that. But for my um, charts like this, I'll, I'll just show it quickly because I don't want to you know, you're not supposed to sew charts yeah, yeah, online, sure. but anyways, yeah, yeah. just to give you an idea, mm -hmm. this, this kind of thing, I actually have to lay out um, in Illustrator. So I, I bring the entire thing into Illustrator. It makes a bigger file, mm. but I just find it's clearer when I get them uh, professionally printed. Um, so yeah, so for the paper, the paper charts are really a different, a different thing altogether than the PDFs that I sell on my website. They look different too. All the, um, uh, you know, there's usually a background on these charts um, where the photo will go, for example, the photo will go right to the edge and these kinds of things. But on the PDF version, it's just a page size with a little photo here and, and all white. Mm -hmm. I don't want to waste people's ink, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, then yeah, so for the most part, I use... Cool. Cool. Oh, sorry. There must be a bit of a lag. I think we, I think we <laughs> talk over. Uh, I was just going to summarize and say that the Illustrator, Photoshop are the two main things I use. Um, and then Adobe Acrobat um, is really great for editing PDFs. Mm. So then in 2012, you were like, right, I'm going to sink my teeth into this cross stitch design business. Yeah, I guess I didn't go into that part of the story. So I was originally doing the clothing and the cross stitch stuff simultaneously for about five years, actually, give or take. Um, and, uh, you know, I was primarily thinking of myself as a fashion designer. I don't know why I was holding on to it because it's what I'd done for school and it was, um, you know, and I was semi-successful with it, but to be honest, uh, the cross-stitch stuff always outsold my clothing. <laughs> okay. um, and it went, right? I don't know. So, and I love doing it. I mean, I really do love drawing and, and, and selling my work, my art. Um, and so at one point uh, I said, I think I'm just going to have to make the switch. And it, it was about 20, 2012, 2013, I think. Um, I, I, just, uh, I just folded the other side of the business and and, and went with uh, the cross-stitch stuff. 
Have you got an idea how many patterns you've got under your belt? Oh my gosh. In total, I don't know, three or 400 maybe. I don't know more. I don't know. <laughs> how would you, Lots. how would you describe your aesthetic? My aesthetic. Well, I think I have an overarching tendency to use bright colors, um, really bold um, combinations. I think I start generally with the colors first because I there's something about putting palettes together that I absolutely love. I like finding fresh palettes. I think it might be the fashion designer coming out in me, right? <laughs> it's just there's all sort of a trend direction and um, and I do still kind of follow those things. And really, there's some really interesting color combinations that you can achieve, even just with DMC floss. Um, mm. You know, they've got a really lovely number of really bright colors. I tend to use the same maybe dozen colors a lot. I know you like 666, so six, the cross-stitch thread of the beast. I know that one's a particular favorite of yours. <laughs> yes. Yes. Red is, red is lovely. I do. Well, and to be honest, I love 718, uh, 907. Um, I use a lot of, in, in golds, I go... Yeah, 718 is kind of a fuchsia. Um, uh, 907 is the really sort of lime green. Mm -hmm. uh, like 9, 958, 959, those teals are really nice. Yeah, they're good ones. Um, they go well with the coral colors, yeah. I always find. You know, I can't think what the... The coral, yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, they, have, they really do have some lovely colors. Um, and once in a while, like I do try to branch out a little bit. It was something unexpected. So I'll often try to use those colors and then pull in kind of a... I don't know, like a weird one or something, just to kind of like balance things up. Um, but yeah, so that the color thing is definitely where I start. Um, and then in terms of the um, the look, I mean, I think a modern sort of clean look is where I generally go. Although, you know, I, I don't try to limit myself too, too much. I'm a Gemini and uh, I think I kind of, I kind of, I'm all over the map really, <laughs> you know. Um, I started, where, where I started with these modern um, chairs and modern furniture, I branched out a little bit. And for a while I kept myself in this space um, thinking that people had come to know me for a certain look, right? The, mm. the modern furniture, the retro, uh, you know, retro appliances, very, very sort of mid-century modern looking things. And I love that stuff, but eventually it got to a point where I had kind of run out of subject matter. Mm. And, um, and for a while I was kind of stumped. I thought, well, where do I go from here? And, um, and I think things have slowly branched out and now I feel like I'm a lot more uh, free with my, with my aesthetic. Um, but it's taken a while, I think, to, um, to get to a point where, um, you know, I have a look. I think some designers right off the bat have a, have a point of view that, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention names, but I, yeah, cool. you know, I think Doreen Jones is, yeah, I was going to say Doreen Jones has such a wonderful um, look to her patterns. Like you can always tell it's one of hers, right? Like she's got a really very clear point of view and uh, um, Stitch Rovia, right? Like Emma Condon is another one. Mm. Um, and to, to both designers I admire quite a lot. Um, but, uh, but for me, I feel like I was just sort of all over the map. And, um, and I, I think that's fine. What ties my stuff together, I think is the, um, the colors, the boldness. Um, you know, sometimes I feel like doing a lot of backstitching. Sometimes I feel like just doing something simple. You know, I just do what I feel. <laughs> One of the things I thought was interesting was you said when you, so you uh, create a pattern, you sketch it out on paper first, take a photo, bang it into your software. You said then you start with the backstitch. So like you, you lay the backstitch down first. I do. If the piece has a lot of backstitch, I generally do. Um, I, I, think, I think most people do that. It's, it's kind of like a coloring book in that sense, right? You've got your pencil drawing, you, you know, you draw the lines and then you can just sort of color them in. Um, for other, for other things, oh, I, can, I, I have a few things I can show. Um, like this little one, I've been showing it a couple times, this mice, this mouse girl. She doesn't have any, well, very little backstitch whatsoever. Right. So this one, um, I, I started with a little sketch and then I just, again, I put it, I laid it behind the grid and then I draw over top of it. Um, and uh, the backstitching obviously was sort of secondary, but it depends on the piece. If it's quite heavy in backstitching, um, then I find it, it better to do it first because then you, you, can, you can fill in the, the, the sort of the pixel squares afterwards. I sometimes find that backstitch is, it's one of those things that you can tell the difference, like a, a competent cross-stitch designer 
knows how to use backstitch mm -hmm. to like crisp up a design or to add extra layers. And sometimes, I, you know, there are lots of designers you'll see on Etsy and stuff like that who they're very flat. They don't really go into the backstitch, but it's interesting how it does provide another like textural layer on the top. Yes, absolutely. And for some designs, I find um, it really makes it pop. Um, mm. uh, I'm trying to think of a couple, like I think all my Beast Core news, a lot of them have the backstitch. Um, I'll show maybe like this little guy, the fox. You see her? Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So there is, there is some, and really, I mean, she's still pretty kind of cartoony, right? Like she's got a cute little mm -hmm. um, look to her. Um, but yeah, I do find the backstitching is kind of, um, there is kind of a knack to it, right? Because you don't want to, you don't want to necessarily outline too small of an area. Um, you know, like these little mushrooms are okay, but, um, but I find if you, you know, it can get too heavy as well. So there, at some points, you know, you don't necessarily want them to, to line up completely. You're like, you don't want it to fill it in. So it's so heavy. You want it to sort of accent it for the most part. Mm. Um, you know, like in the tail, you want to get texture there um, and like with the leaves for example I put in the center of the leaf but you don't outline the entire thing or it would just seem like a, a blob um, so yeah you sort of have to play with it I think a little bit um, to was, just give it the right amount of back stitching for the piece back in the good old days when I used to do cross stitch for fun just doesn't happen anymore but I always used to enjoy doing the back stitching you know because that would be <laughs> like the final flourish wouldn't it It'd be the yeah. thing that makes it come alive it's true it's true you're Makes also absolutely. I agree. You're also quite hot on the Biscornu. Then I'm not really very Biscornu familiar. So perhaps you can explain it to me because I know that you've got quite the passion for them, right? Sure. Sure. Um, again, that sort of happened. Uh, I guess everything sort of happens accidentally. Maybe um, I was designing uh, a bunch of things for. Uh, I won't, I won't say who, but I was designing something for a larger company and then they sort it of rhymes posted with. me. <laughs> Company's name. Yeah, rhymes, rhymes with, with uh, Anchor. No, yeah, anyway. That, well, yeah. So, yeah, rhymes with that movie company, AMC. Um, <laughs> anyhow, so they, uh, I guess they switched uh, ownership and anyways, I'm not, no hard feelings or anything, but what happened was I had a number of designs that I had done for them and then I guess they switched directions and, and didn't need them anymore. So. I had all of these things um, for, I guess they were going to be towel bands, you know, those stitchable bathroom mm -hmm. towel designs. And uh, a lot of them were uh, flowers and birds and things. And so I thought, well, I should really repurpose these. Um, they're, you know, they're great little motifs, but I wasn't sure what to do with them. And I do, I do like a good Beast Cornu, you know, they're kind of a fun shape. They're unusual. They're quite easy to put together, actually. Um, like they're deceivingly simple to put together. Um, and I thought, well, I could run, you know, I've been doing stitch, stitch alongs for a while. I thought oh, I could probably run uh, like a Beast Corner of the Month thing. Um, and then I just took, I think I had about five or six of these little flower and bird motifs already done. So I reworked them into Beast Cornus and then I, I designed the last six or seven of them. Um, and I thought, well, it could be a fun thing. We'll just see what people like. Um, and that's where this whole uh, 2018 um, Beast Corner of the Month Club came from was, mm -hmm. was that experience. Um, so what, what do they say? Necessity is the mother of all invention. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the same, right? Um, so I had these designs and I thought, oh, I could put them together into these little cute East Cornus. Like this, this little flower here was one of them. And I thought, oh, I can throw a little bird on there. Put a bird on it, as they say. <laughs> they do, yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, so that was where that came from. And, um, and I just, I thought they were so cute that I thought, well, I should do, I should do another one. So now I've got three years worth of uh, East Cornu of the Months. And um, uh, the second year I did a fantasy series. Um, to be honest, the hardest part is coming up with 12 uh, or an idea that will encompass 12 good little designs for mm. the year. Like it's, it's tricky to come up with something that is, um, you know, open enough to allow for creativity, but also, you know. You should, you should try the Zodiac. I hear that's a good one. The Zodiac. Well, you know. You know what? I thought of that actually, but this year, believe it or not, I'm doing a Zodiac stitch along. Amazing. So it's starting in January. Yeah. So it's going to be, um, that was actually my, my thinking. I thought originally I was going to do Beast Cornus and I thought, oh, this is too good. Like I should really do a big, like a big piece. So it's, it's coming in January, a uh, 12, a well, 13 month actually, because there's a couple of secret motifs that are coming at the end, but nice. uh, yeah, yeah. The Zodiac that's coming up. 
so yeah, so this, this, this one was the, uh, the 2019 one. And then the last, uh, this past year, I have all these little animals that I've done. So, um, so it does seem like I have a lot of Beast Cornus and they're just so fun to put, to put together. Um, Can I ask a really dumb question? Are, yeah. I don't, want yeah, people, of course. I don't want people to be hating me afterwards. What do you do with them afterwards? They're not pin cushions, are they? Oh, well, they can be pin cushions. I, I don't know if you can see the back here, but I, I kind of display them around the, the house. So you can see in the back, we can hmm. take a little trip over. <laughs> if I can show this to you. I, I just have them out and around. Like okay. you can see there's like a little shelf. Of them. I stack them. Um, I actually don't, I don't really use them as pin cushions as much. Um, you can make them perhaps? into ornaments. Yeah, jogging practice, exactly. Um, you can use them as um, uh, tree ornaments if you make them, you know, these are stitched all on uh, 14 or 16 count, but if you did them over one and they were tiny, you could hang it on the Christmas tree or, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've seen people do a bunch of things or make them into scissor fobs, right? You yeah. could do uh, like a little, little scissor fob with them. Um, so yeah, I think there's, they're, they're fun. And then, I, like I said, I, I use them as just kind of decorative, um, you know, I, I stack one out, you know, seasonally, right? I have, so for fall, I had all my fall ones out. Um, I just use them as decorations around the house, basically, right? That's cool. That's cool. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, those kind of sequential, so like your Biscor New of the Month and then Stitch Alongs, those form quite a core part of your business, would you say? I would say, yeah. Um, again, quite coincidentally, I, uh, I started in 2017. I think the Halloween one was my first stitch along. I really didn't know what I was doing or what to expect. It's, it really is just a, just a game, I guess, right? You try something and see if it works and then mm. you can improve on it as you go. Um, and uh, yeah, I actually love doing stitch alongs now. I think there's so much more engagement, I think, that you can get mm. from your... Uh, from your customers and stitchers. I have a really great uh, Facebook group um, that's actually up to, I think, close to 6,000 people in it. Nice. Um, and, uh, and it's just for, for tiny modern stuff. People, people show their work. They, you know, they can ask questions. I'm in there quite often. So, um, you know, they can ask me questions or, or just, just a, like a level of engagement. So usually it's, it's just open to any tiny modern. It's not a particular uh, stitch along. So people, whatever they're stitching, they can share. But you can sort of see like the Halloween and Christmas ones were, were kind of big the last few months because that's what everyone was stitching. And then the, the every season one, people are, are showing. It's a, the year long one. Um, I can show you that one. Is that the one with the four houses? <laughs> yeah. This yeah, one. that was really cool. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that Facebook group is, is a great place for people to showcase their stuff. And, um, and uh, yeah, so the stitch alongs, I think, People like them because they're uh, oh, just a way to sort of feel connected, I think, with, with their stitching. Um, and they're always available afterwards, too. I, mm. I don't really like making my stuff go out of print or become unavailable. So once it's done, it's still available as a full PDF or um, shops still carry the, the charts. They'll never become unavailable for any foreseeable reason, anyways. Do you keep um, yours as mystery stitch alongs? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fun. Mm. I think, I <laughs> mean, you know what I try? I try. To... Oh, sorry. No, go on. <laughs> I was just going to say, I was just going to say one quick thing is that I do try to show a little sneak peek so that people get a sense of what they are. I don't want somebody to just walk in blind completely and not know what they're stitching. But um, so I'll, I'll publish the, the floss colors, um, you know, a little sneak peek of a motif or something just so they get an idea. And I usually describe it fairly well well too because um you know just so you know what you're getting into <laughs> yeah i've i mean i launched some to do with the magazine this year something to do and it has it's been really rewarding to because you get a little community don't you and they all start to help one yes. another as they go through the process and it's yeah. just like one of the people in our group shout out to claire she always tells really bad jokes every time she posts a picture as well oh. just adds nice. to the effect well, but yeah it's that, that other yeah. struggle because i've got um the latest one that I'm going to be doing, which is called Can Can, I've described it as a pop art stash buster because it's got like 145 colors. But the thing is, is if I show even like a blurred out image of it, it will probably kind of give the game away. So I feel really like people have right. to take this big leap of faith and they don't quite know how sure. to do that. I also completely cheat because what I do is I find pixel artists who are doing interesting designs and then I license their work for them which is a way of kind of sure. getting around my own inadequacies, I suppose. <laughs> well, 
well, you know, you've got to do what works. So nothing wrong with that. Mm. But yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I guess so he heaven, and earth, have heaven and Earth does that, right? Don't they license, uh, you know, they license other people's artworks and, and, mm. and publish them? I think, yeah, whatever, whatever works. Mm. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Well, you know, I think once people, I mean, this is your second stitch along, yes? Um, the can can will be the third one. The third one, okay. And so by now, people probably know what to expect from you. And they, they, I think you, you probably gain a level of trust. Mm. Um, you know, so I don't think it's such a big deal if you don't show too, too much of it, right? If you want to keep it a mystery. I so, suppose part of the trick yeah, is to, yeah. to you try and make a variety between, you know, if the last one's quite big and there's lots of pieces, then maybe the next one's smaller and more user-friendly from the start or something. <laughs> Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question because on the one hand, people come to expect a certain type of thing from you. Um, but on the other hand, you want to keep it fresh, right? Mm. Um, yeah, I, I do try to do that. What, my, what ends up happening with me, because I, I kind of keep them usually seasonal. So I'll have a year long thing with its own kind of theme. And then what I've been doing for the last three years is a, a Halloween one, an Easter one, and a holiday Christmas kind of design. And what usually happens is I'll start with the Halloween one and it'll have a certain uh, look or style. So for example, last year um, I did one uh, that was, um, you could do it in four bands separately, or you could stitch it together as one big square, but each of those bands would also be able to make itself into a drum, like a 3D pin cushion. So it was kind of like a, a design that had a little you know, kind of a twist to it, I guess. And there was four bonus circle designs. So that layout, um, I carried that over into the Christmas one. So you could, it was, the design was different, but the, the layout of the four bands was the same. And then the same with the Easter. I, Easter is a slightly smaller holiday. So I did three rather than four. So it's slightly mm -hmm. smaller design. And so each year kind of has a, a look to it. So for, for this year, we did um, the Halloween Ouija design and it was like a central haunted house with some little motifs around the outside. And I carried that over into Christmas. Um, I can show you the Christmas one here. So the, the size and the shape basically are the same, but the, the theme is different, right? Mm. Like this one here, it's not even finished, but this guy here. Okay. So that central motif and then the, the things running around it. So the Halloween one was the same. It had a big haunted house in the middle and then Halloween motifs around the outside. Um, and then for, for Easter, I have an Easter one coming out also in January. Um, and it's, again, just a slightly smaller version of that. Um, so each year I kind of keep it, you know, then people kind of know what to expect for that sort of year of, of designs. I'm um, also noting... And then next year... Go on. No, 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 that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I'm just rambling. <laughs> um, I was going to say, I'm also noticing that you don't stick to two dimensions much. You quite like going in 3D kind of directions. Yeah, well, you know there's only so much wall space that people have mm -hmm. <laughs> and I do and I do quite like um, giving people options so for a lot of my stuff you could you could do it flat and frame it um, but I like interesting finishes too uh, you know just to kind of differentiate myself or and it's kind of fun to, to have different things so um, yeah I do I do like different finishes like scissor fobs and beast cornus and, and you know little round pin cushions and things um, I think it just gives people different options. Um, but like I said, I do, I do try to make my stuff so that you could, if you wanted to just straight up frame it and, you know, and have it hanging on the wall. So. Mm. I feel like when I look at, cause I span back through your Instagram and I was kind of looking in a lot of your designs when you go that quickly, you know, you just get a sort of an essence of it. And it feels like there's a sort of modern traditional approach to what you do. Like a lot of the designs do have a nod back to designs you might've seen. 80 years ago, something like that. But obviously you've got your color palettes and your decisions about design that kind of, do you think like, because you're Canadian as well, I feel like there's quite a strong sort of cross stitch history or narrative or something. Is that something you can talk about? Um, I mean, I guess, I don't know if it's a Canadian thing because I feel like needlepoint probably traces back. I mean, Canada is not that old, right? So it probably mm. traces back into, into Europe, right? In the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know my yeah. family history. Yeah. Or originally it is from there. Um, and uh, so I would say, 
yes, to a certain extent that I, I do like to give a nod to, uh, to tradition. Uh, I mean, maybe that's just my aesthetic, you know, loving mid-century stuff, loving vintage stuff. I do, I do absolutely love, um, you know, history, the history of needlepoint and the history of art and architecture and fashion and everything like that. And so um, I do try to just take needlepoint, which is really a, a very traditional art, and just kind of pull it into the 21st century with bright colors and, um, uh, you know, interesting motifs and things like that, but without, you know, with really the understanding that it is a, it is kind of an ancient art and I want to kind of respect that as well. So. Did you do any of it as a kid? You said you got back into it. Yes, I did. Yeah. I mean, really, I wasn't that good. I look back at the stuff now and there's, you know, the X's are all going different ways and I was <laughs> knots on the back and <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't that patient as a child, actually. Uh, but my mom, uh, my mom and grandmother, well, my grandmother did more needlepoint, but um, my mom cross-stitched and uh, I have a few little pieces that I did. One major one that I tried to do as a teenager, it was uh, like a dimensions kit, a large, a very large dragon and St. George. It was really quite intricate and I loved it. And it took me probably two years. And I, I never finished it. Uh, there's so many mistakes in now, I think it's probably going to forever be a whip in my parents' basement, but, mm -hmm. um, but I did, I did really love cross-stitching then. And, uh, you know, then my early twenties, you know, you just get busy with school and life and things like that. And it kind of fell away. But, uh, um, I, as I said, I rediscovered again when, um, when I was just expecting my first daughter, because, uh, well, I was a bit more housebound towards, <laughs> towards the end of it. And, mm -hmm. uh, I thought oh, we should pick up some, some needlepoint again. And, uh, um, so I ended up doing a bunch of cross-stitch gifts for, um, my family like that year at Christmas time I did some ornaments for my mom and things like that and I think that's um, so, yeah, I so I did, I did uh, yeah you yeah, know yeah. that so it's always been part of life. yeah go on sorry <laughs> no, no 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 that's okay like there must be kind of a, a bit of a lag but that's all I was going to say yeah it's always been a part of my life yeah and that's the thing I was wondering is like so when you're creating these pieces is there this sort of sense of like history you know your own personal history and stuff do you feel that you have a responsibility and uh is there you know you want to do the thing proud because it it's got that nostalgia for you yeah that's a nice way to put it yes i think so maybe maybe subconsciously to a certain extent um but like i said i think i just have a respect for the craft you know um that it's it's kind of a there's a long line of um you know, of women and, and, and particularly in my family, but really all over the place of, of people, I should say, maybe not just women, um, who have, uh, who have been carrying on this tradition. So. Yeah, it's certainly um, quite unusual. But you know, I think, Go on. yeah, I was, I was going to say, I think it's our responsibility now to, um, to really bring it into the public eye. Like, I think it's, it's one of these arts that I don't want to lose, you know, culturally, I think. Um, and, and I think the way to do that is to modernize it, right? I mean, um, well, I had, I had a fashion teacher who actually once told me, she said, people want different, but not too different. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of good advice, right? Um, you know, you make a, you know, a beautiful dress or whatever, and everyone says, well, can we have it in black? So it's, it's that kind of thing, I think, with, with cross-stitch, or the way, I, the way I'm looking at it anyways. Um, there's lots of ways to look at it, but um, I think it's a traditional craft. It's got all these beautiful motifs that are, um, you know, very meaningful because they've been brought down through the ages type thing, but you can, you know, you can give it your own special new touch. Right. So I tried that through colors and through sort of changing things a little bit and uh, um, yeah, with always respect for it. I suppose there's this thing of if you, if you stretch it too far, people lose the connection between the cross stitch they're familiar with and what you've created, isn't it? And, I suppose part of my argument is that it's not been stretched far enough. So at least with the magazine, now I'm right. trying to just pull things a bit sure. and, and ground it. But I acknowledge exactly what you're saying there is you still have to maintain the overarching context of cross stitch, don't you? Because otherwise yes. it's yeah. something completely different. Yeah. No, but it's true though. I mean, I think you always have to push the boundaries and I think that there's a place for all of us in that. I mean, if we were all, if we were all doing what I'm doing, then <laughs> that'd be sort of boring, wouldn't it? So, you know, I think, I think it's good that you're pushing the boundaries and finding people that are, that are pushing the boundaries. I and mean, I think the boundaries should be always shifting forward. Mm. And, um, 
you know, I think that cross stitch can really be almost anything that you want it to be. It's, it's pixel art. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's meditation. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's all these really, I think, bigger than just thread and, and fabric. And so really the question I think is, um, where, where do we want to take it right in this, in the modern world? I mean, um, it, it can really be almost anything you want. I mean, there's lots of, there's lots of designers out there that are not, um, traditional at all and their work is beautiful and amazing you know um, so yeah I don't I don't think there's anything I think there's a place for for us all to have a voice in that and uh, I think it's great that you're pushing the boundaries and, and finding people who are who are doing that I also think it's quite nice though to work with designers like you and like Maria Diaz and Lucy Heaton and people who've spent time if you like working within the mainstream because then I just give you an opportunity to like flare off in a different direction or something like that yes seems to be quite a nice yeah. opportunity as well. That is true, actually. And it's true. It's, it's funny that you bring that up. I have noticed like Lucy and Maria's work in your, in your magazines do tend to be outside of what they normally uh, show, right? Mm. And it's true. I think, I think as a designer, sometimes you do put constraints on yourself, whether they're self-imposed or, uh, you know, as you said, through the mainstream publications. Um, so it is kind of nice to take a little detour now and again. And uh, your magazine is actually, I think, um, a great spot for that because you're you're very um, uh, inclusive, right? Of of all kinds of things, and uh, I, I found that actually for myself, even when when uh, you know you get the one word theme, which I find at first quite um, intimidating, <laughs> because I you know it's like what could you do? There's a, a million and one ideas, and it's um, I, I have to actually self impose some restrictions on myself to to be able to make some design decisions down the road, but. But it is nice to have that freedom as well. And uh, I feel like, a, you know, the designs I've put into your magazine are, are slightly outside of what I would uh, perhaps publish um, myself through, you know, like what people expect maybe from me. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think, it's, I think you have a good forum there for, uh, for self-expression. It's like a palate cleansing sorbet or something. You can do a bit of that and then crack on with the stuff that there you go. in the box. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Um, there you go. There you um, go. Can we talk about like, I don't know, like I, I always think it's interesting to see the kind of marketing approaches that people take. You know, you've got a business, presumably, I don't know if you have a huge team beneath you. I know I definitely don't. There's nobody down there. So, you know, how you like, how much time, for instance, you spend designing as opposed to marketing as opposed to, I mean, do you stitch your own yes. stuff or do you have model stitches as well or? Yeah, so the team, I do have some model stitchers. Uh, I have about five or six people, not that they're always working, but that I call on. Um, but that's really all that I outsource. I do outsource my taxes. That, my bookkeeping, <laughs> yeah. I used to do all myself. And that, God damn. that is one thing I definitely recommend. Outsource that if you can. It's worth the expense. Um, so, so really, I outsource that to, to somebody and I outsource some of the stitching, although I, I do love stitching. I mean, that's really why we're most of us are in this. So I, I do some of the model stitching myself as, as time permits. Mm -hmm. um, and then a lot of the bigger pieces, um, you know, I have girlfriends that will stitch for me and I, you know, I compensate them, but um, uh, I don't have time to do like huge pieces really. Um, uh, but yeah, so I, everything else is done by me. So marketing, production, printing, shipping, that's, that's all me. <laughs> do you find that, because um, for instance, I find that some of the things like magazine production and some of the marketing stuff is equally creative. So while I might not necessarily get a lot of creative fulfillment through cross stitch anymore, I can still, you know, you still get your juices flowing through those other channels. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think everything that I do in my work is creative and I, I tend to lump things together. So my, the sort of monthly um, uh, sort of cycle that I'm on has, you know, a, a portion of the month that I'm basically spending, like getting my wholesale stuff out. So it'd be a lot of printing, packing, um, you know, filling orders for shops and, and the wholesalers, the distributors. Um, and then, you know, another week will be designing for the next, you know, couple months, um, finishing up models, doing the finishing, like all the finishing of stuff I do myself, um, photographing. So I, I kind of lump things together and it kind of progresses um, that way. But it's all creative. I mean, some days I'm a photographer, some days I'm a magazine, you know, layout person, you know, it's, it's really all creative stuff. Um, uh, 
and I, I love it really. I mean, <laughs> there's not there's not a lot of um, negative aspects about our job. I mean, I think we're quite fortunate that that there's so much um, so much creativity involved in it. Mm. Do you have certain social media platforms that you favor over others? Yeah, I stick to Instagram and Facebook. Um, I love Instagram. I think as a visual person, it's it's like a wonderful platform and it has just enough, I think, interaction with people commenting and things like that. But really it's just the focus is on the images and that's what I love. Um, I, I used to do a bit of Twitter, but it's, you know, Twitter ends up being like, Hey, look at my photo. And then you have to click on a link to get there. So it doesn't seem to really, mm. it's kind of a two step thing for people. So I don't, I don't really use it as much. And then Facebook, um, I kind of cheat. I, I post things on Instagram and then I click the button that says post to Facebook page. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I just, I sort of kill two birds with one stone there. Um, but like I said, I do go um, specifically into the Facebook group, which I find as probably the highest level of um, interaction for people mm -hmm. um, directly like with me. Um, so I would say those, those two platforms, um, but specifically the, the group is what I focus on on Facebook. Um, and then Instagram is for, you know, I try to post, uh, I've been kind of lax lately, but I try to post five or six times a month, if not a few more, but um, we actually moved just recently. So I really have been not very, not very active on social media. <laughs> Do you, um, I was going to say, because I, I think the thing that happened, like, because I started the Mr. X Stitch website in 2008, and, you know, it was like Flickr and various things like that. But I do think Instagram was quite instrumental in, like, the throughput of people sharing their work and gaining inspiration from yeah. others. Like you say, because of that visual format, it's like Twitter, to me, is largely irrelevant as well, because it's not like, yeah. you want real-world news kind of live events in Twitter's fine. But Instagram definitely yeah. seems to be the one that gives you that, opportunity to sink into sort of inspiration yes i agree yeah to some extent pinterest as well although there isn't as much interaction there um but i do post i, well, I guess it's more pinning i do pin things to pinterest um and uh and i get a, quite a few visitors through every month um but there isn't that level of social interaction it's more um you know, i mean i take inspiration from pinterest here and there like for house decorating things like that right um, so I think it's more of an inspiration spot, but not as much, you know, you know, face, face to face type of yeah. interaction. It's a funny um, one, isn't it? Pinterest yeah. seems to be more like yeah. a sort of search engine. Like I know I was interviewing yes. Menorise in a previous one and, you know, she gets a lot of her business comes from Pinterest because people are looking for the inspiration ah. there and then it just brings right. them through to her. And so it tends to be a useful platform for that kind of thing. Like I need to do more of it myself. I did a, a Black Friday and got a deal on Tailwind, which is one where you can like schedule pins and it makes it really easy for you to sit oh. down and like batch produce a lot of Pinterest content. Yes. Which is something that I need. Yes. Um, do you yeah, I've tried, I've tried things like that. Yeah. I've tried yeah. Hootsuite before. Yeah, yeah. Hootsuite was good for a while there, wasn't which it? Is, which is okay. Yeah, but I, to be honest, I'm not that organized. <laughs> so I, I tend to just, I think, oh, I should probably post something today. <laughs> mm. So yeah I, yeah, I do have a bit of a marketing calendar that I go by. And I do plan, especially with stitch alongs, um, you know, I'm planning, like I have almost all of 2021 planned already. Okay. And um, a, lot, a lot of the designs, like, so I have, a, I have a marketing calendar that I work from and you basically figure out when you want to put something out and you work backwards to see when the model has to be done, when, when do you have to have the charts produced, you know, those kinds of things. So mm. um, in that sense, I, I keep myself fairly organized. Um, but uh, yeah, with social media, it doesn't seem to be organized yet. <laughs> Um, you know, I try to post, like, if something comes out, I'll post about it, but, um, Do you use the uh, Facebook Creator Studio? Have you tried that? Oh, no. So no. that's like, because obviously Facebook owns Instagram, so it's kind of like they've got a platform yeah. set up there where you can basically produce all your content within the Creator Studio. And if you just search for it, you'll find it. Because if you've got like a, I think you have to have a business account maybe on Facebook, but presumably yes. you do have your Facebook. Yeah, I do. Yeah. But it means that you can schedule posts to go out in advance and you can also schedule them to go to Facebook or Instagram at one time, you know, and that sort of thing. So uh, that's quite useful because they've set it up so that you can have like an inbox where you can just read all the comments and all those sorts of things. So instead of like getting sidetracked by Cheryl McKinnon Facebook, you can just keep it on like yeah. Tiny Modernist Facebook, which I find quite useful. Uh, 
huh, well, I should try that. Yeah. No, I haven't, I haven't used that. I do have the business page, but um, I find since they changed their dashboard, it's a little more confusing than it used to be. Like they, they switched over shortly uh, a little mm. while ago. Um, do you spend but, money uh, with Facebook? Yeah, like I said. Do you pay for adverts and stuff? No, I don't. Um, I don't promote on Instagram or on Facebook. You know, it's probably something that is worthwhile, but I just, I found I haven't, I haven't really needed it. Um, actually, I should say now, I, I talked about those kinds of social medias, but I do have a MailChimp mailing newsletter. Yes. Um, and that for me does very well. I have over 12,000 people on that list. Nice. And I don't know. I mean, I didn't, I don't do anything special to get them to sign up. I think people just really like getting it's just through my website. People like getting news and updates. And mm -hmm. I think it's awesome that people sign up. And, um, and that actually is a great way to talk to people. I, I'm not, I really don't like those companies that send you emails every single day. I'm not like that. Um, I think I send about five or six out a year, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, um, but just when there's, when there's really important things, like I had a black Friday sale still going on actually until tomorrow. Um, you know, so I, I, sent people information about that or when a new stitch along is coming out, I'll send people information about that. Um, so just the key, the key times in a year. And I find the response rate um, quite high actually. And I think, um, you know, and, and I think people kind of trust, you know, they have their trust in me, so I don't want to take advantage and just spam them all the time. So I just only send out very key things uh, to them. So. I think that's, it's like old school marketing, but there's no denying that email marketing is like rule 101, isn't it? Get yourself a mailing list. You've got people who've said they yeah. want to talk to you. And then I know pound yes. for pound, that's my best time spent is sending an email out that's maybe got a couple of offers. But, but a lot of the time, just like sharing you with people, isn't it? You know, people want to hear about you yes. and a bit about your product. Yeah. And like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, no, it's funny. It is. It, you're right. It is kind of an old school way, but um but I think hands down it, in terms of the response rate, it, it does always win out over Instagram and Facebook for me. I've got a pro mm -hmm. tip for you, which I done myself, is I know that when you click over 10,000 people on uh, MailChimp, it starts to cost quite a lot. And what I did was I, I did a filter where it was like anybody who hasn't opened the last 20 campaigns, I yeah. kind of archive them. So you still yes. kind of got their details, but it dramatically, like for me, it dropped my number yeah. below 10,000, which saved me about 30 yeah. dollars a month or something. So, Well, you know, what's, what's interesting, yeah, because it was, it was climbing up there, the price, and I thought, geez, is it really, is it really still worth, I mean, it's kind of pricey, right? Mm. Um, but uh, just recently, I think I must have been on a legacy plan because I went in there just recently and they had an, an updated uh, price, pricing plan that I went on to, which... I guess you can get onto one that's up to 50,000 people and it was less than what I'm, than what I was paying mm. um, because I was doing the same thing. I was archiving people. Um, you know, I would archive like a hundred here, hundred there. And I'm like, well, this is still, you know, it's still costing me. So um, yeah, I don't know. There's just recently, they must've had a new pricing plan. Um, it's probably one of those so things where if you work out that, you know, if you're earning more than you're spending, then it kind of balances yes. out, isn't it? And yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely the old school way. Do you do you, uh, do you have an Etsy shop? <laughs> I do. I started it in two thousand and eight. I think now I may have had four hundred sales in the twelve years I've been running yeah. that shop. Yeah, it, yeah. It was. I mean, because it was funny. Because yeah, I started in two thousand and eight about the same time as you. And Etsy then was, you know, charming, handmade kind of. Because Etsy it, wasn't it was. publicly listed, and it wasn't the phenomenon yeah. that it is now. Um, yeah. I still think it's important, but I think that it's such a saturated market. Like for me, I don't even sell the magazine on Etsy. I prefer to go like direct yeah. customer, but it's still, yes. it's a valid place to look for that kind of stuff. So it's worth having a, a hold on there. But I still think there are probably more savvy ways of getting business in, on Etsy. Yeah, I, I agree. I think if I was just starting out now, Etsy probably wouldn't be my first go-to place. Um, although it's quite easy to open up a little shop. It's hard to get the sales, like you said. Mm. Um, but yeah, I've been, I've been on there for a number of years. And I was just going to mention that the, the one place I do promoted listings is through Etsy. Um, and they, they sort of force it on you, actually, um, uh, based on like a revenue, <laughs> revenue stream of last year. They, they sort of force on the, the, they started doing a whole plan of Google promotion. Um, but actually, I find that um, it doesn't increase my costs too much, not as dramatically as they were originally 
saying. Um, and, uh, and Etsy actually is, is still a decent platform uh, for me. I have a number of customers because I don't actually offer my stitch alongs on there. I'm like you, I offer kind of a reduced a number of, of things in the shop. And really the idea is to drive traffic ultimately to my own website. Mm. Um, but, uh, but people do, I think the SEO there is pretty decent. So, you know, you're found a lot more. Um, and uh, um, what I was going to say was, yeah, I do, I do promote a posting there. And it's like you said, it's, it's kind of a gauge of like, are you, are you still making more than you're, than you're selling, right? Um, mm-hmm. Or sorry, making more than you're spending on the, on the promoted posts. Um, so yeah, Etsy is one place that I do pay for that kind of thing. I mean, that the SEO is awesome. It has to be said, I was almost going to try and do a bit of a hack to try and get better rankings for the magazine by using Etsy. And in the end, it didn't, yeah. didn't pan out. But they've got such good, mm-hmm. like you say, if you promote you, and then someone does a search for something cross it's like, it'll be up there. You'll get, yeah. get good yeah. Google rankings. I've only recently started yeah. doing Google adverts with any kind of sense of knowing what I'm doing because for a long time I was just, I don't know, dithering or something. Yeah. Yeah, Google, I don't, uh, I mean, I do have Google uh, business listing and things like that with some photos on there. And I have done, um, I do some, my, my alter ego does a little bit of uh, web stuff and graphic stuff for nonprofit. And uh, I have worked with somebody doing Google posting there. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Do you find it worthwhile to do, uh, to do Google listings, Google ads? I think what I'm finding is that A, you've got to get your analytics set up properly. I did mine all wrong for a while and it was counting every page visit as a conversion, which made it look like I was getting oh. like 700 conversions a week or something, which is definitely wrong. Right. Um, but I think that it seems to me the secret with Google advertising is to set out keywords that you want to be found for, but spend more time setting yeah. out negative keywords that you don't want to be found for. Because that way you can, oh, you know, if someone puts cross stitch, but you don't want them to have like horror, you, you're not a horror cross stitch person for the sake of argument. So you have that as a negative one and it just starts to refine the, the opportunities for you to kind of pop up and stuff like that. So that yeah. seems to be hard. Oh, inter- yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know about the negative uh, keywords. That's a smart, that's a smart thing actually. And it's true that that means you're much more likely to be found by someone who's actually looking for your style of of work than just to pop up randomly. And you can drill down by kind of like demographics and countries and stuff like that. But it's that thing of, you know, if you just put cross stitch, that's such a diverse market. And then you'll also end up with like stitch or you might end up with knitting and stuff. So you want to put negative keywords so you don't get knitting and you don't get for the sake of argument, hand embroidery, any of those sorts of things. You really can. So for me, I've been able to kind of do that and you kind of go, what words do I want to describe my, product and put those in and then it will suggest keywords and then you can go through and go well I don't want that one and I don't want that one and I don't want that one and paste those in as your negative ones so it's almost like you get Google's ads yeah. to do the grunt work for you and then yeah, yeah. You kind of huh. and then it's just a question of like tracking your conversions so that you know if you've spent and it's quite good sometimes because you might only spend like a dollar on a conversion for the sake yeah. of argument but if that brings yeah. in eight dollars it's all right that sure yeah, it's worth it. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. I should, uh, I'll look into that more. I like the negative keyword. That's, that's a good tip. Yeah. That's, I've done, there's a few podcasts. I tend to do this thing where if I decide I need to learn a thing and I, and my, my schedule is very scattergun with all the different things I'm trying to do, but I'll spend a lot of time trying to listen to podcasts on the subject because when I'm walking the dog, I can kind of catch up with those things. And that's always been quite a good way to do it. Cause like you say, we have so many different hats and it's like, you can't be, a, uh, you can't be an expert in all of those hats. You can be a temporary one or something. It's true. It's true. Well, play to your strengths, I guess. I know, uh, like I'm, I really love, I really, really love the design process. I really love it. And that's, that's really what I would love to spend my time doing. And then the rest of it, I sort of do, you know, I, I enjoy it and it's fun and it's support. It's, but they're more supporting roles, I think, to the, to the design part of things. And I think that's why I've kept, I've kept my business very, um, uh, concentrated right i mean i don't i don't really offer kits very often now and again i might have a uh like a limited edition type thing i don't sell supplies i don't you know really my primary thing is patterns so they know that's that's really where i'm good i'm good at Mm. that um and the rest of it you know i feel like i just wouldn't you know 
I, I don't know that I have time to put together kits and ship them out. Like I feel like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to give people the great service that I, that I want to. And ultimately what it's about, I think is, you know, enabling people to have their own wonderful experience cross stitching. Really, that's, that's really what I want. I want to be able to have, hopefully my patterns give someone joy, <laughs> you know? And um, so I just, everything I do is kind of like streamlined towards that and what I'm good at. And, um, and I feel like if I stray from that and try to offer, you know, other things, it's not going to work as well. <laughs> so, yeah, I know, of, you know, there's, there's friends of mine, uh, I was thinking particularly, for instance, of Hannah Bass, who sells needlepoint kits, and you'll see pictures on her Instagram of all the boxes she's made that day, which are just the boxes, not only yeah. the kit that she's got to put in and stuff. And that, I can understand, like, I'm, I'm probably the same, I kind of veer away from that kind of production -y stuff. Maybe, you know, sometimes yes. I think that that's, a mistake because there's profit to be made in that element but as you say if you True. if you've got more general joy in your life because you've removed parts of frustration that can only be good for the overall output right yeah yeah well and I think too I mean you you probably have the same kind of situation I mean we have families we have dogs um, you know the the time that it takes to uh to put together kits and i do love putting together kits i for nashville uh, every year i offer limited edition kits and I, and I like putting them together um but to be honest my house is full of mayhem most of the time right and so <laughs> you know to be able to have the the space and the time to do that and to store it and then to ship it and coming from canada you, you probably find this with the uk too uh my primary um uh, primary customers come from either the US or, or UK and other places in Europe. And so shipping from Canada is very expensive, actually. Mm. Um, and often I would have to import the supplies from the US, probably pay like duty on it. Like you guys have VAT, we have HST, right? And, and then I'd be shipping it right back into the US. So to be honest, as in, from a cost standpoint, um, it doesn't really make a lot of sense for me to do those on a, on a large scale mm. um because i'm just you know it, it wouldn't necessarily be cost effective to to have to do all the shipping and the you know just everything that's involved with it so i've always shied away from from that although i, I do feel like you said there's there is some profit to be made and people people do like kits you know there's there's something about opening up a box and having everything right there mm. <laughs> to be able yeah. to start stitching right away I think some people expect it as well when i was talking to Millerai, she was saying about in spain and how there's a struggle to sell contemporary cross stitch in Spain because there's quite a traditional mindset and so people actually they want the kit they don't want to go and buy the individual pieces themselves just general because they're used that's to that kind of happening yeah oh that's interesting I mean I never, I never thought of that but it's true I guess you have to play to your you know sort of geographical market right yeah it's um, always fascinating I always like um every now and again I get to meet Bastian who's one of the people at Zweigart and I always like talking to him because he has like this slightly global perspective in that he's like the sort of head of sales for like, I don't know, half of the world or whatever. So he's a great one for understanding, you know, what motivates people in Russia, the kind of designs that they want, big ones, lots of technique and all those sorts of things, as opposed to the UK where perhaps we're a bit more whimsical or something like that. Yeah, yeah. When That's you, interesting. When you um, get down to designing, do you have a sort of... Do you have a, what am I trying to think? Do you have a process in as much as like, do you put music on? Do you absorb other inspiration first? What kind of, you know, because I, I don't presume you just sit down and go, right, I'm going to start designing. You have to kind of get that oh, creative yeah. flow. Just, Are just comes out. <laughs> yeah, just like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is a process. I think it depends what I'm designing for because, um, with, for a magazine, for example, or a publication, there's often constraints, right? There's a uh, general size constraint. Um, sometimes there's a palette constraint, like colors, but not, not as much. Um, but usually there's kind of like an idea there. So they kind of present this and say, well, can you do X, Y, and Z? And it has to be kind of this size and this kind of feel. And so I'm already sitting down with a good idea of where I'm headed. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, sort of sketching and whatnot. Um, if it's something for myself, um, I leave it a bit freer actually, because sometimes, sometimes ideas just kind of pop up. Sometimes they go off of each other. So, um, like where I was talking about the sows kind of play off each other for the full year or the beast core news. I know I've got sort of an animal theme for the year or something. Um, 
And then I kind of sit down and I, I often what I do is I write things down first before I even sketch. Mm. Um, so in the case of a beast canoe, if I've got 12 designs, I'll write down like a bunch of animals, uh, a bunch of ideas, you know, some color ideas. Um, I, I sit down at my computer and I'll, I'll look at a bunch of different stuff, um, different styles of animal photos and drawings and try, try to get some like inspiration. And then I'll start to sketch. Um, and usually, you know, when I really put my mind to it, I can draw quite well, but often my sketches for cross stitch are just like really rough. Um, and I think that's because I know that as soon as I get it into the computer, it's going to sort of change and morph. And um, I think that's why I like working in the computer is because you can do a lot of uh, like control Z is my favorite, my favorite, key, you, know? <laughs> yeah. good one. Good one. <laughs> you know, you can just, yeah, yeah. You can flip things. You can, you can move them around. There's, there's a lot less um, permanent than, than drawing on a piece of paper. Um, so in terms of a process, I think, I think generally, I mean, music, sometimes I have music. I don't know. I, I, I sometimes find that because my house is so chaotic, I like the peace and quiet actually. <laughs> and I often do most of my designing in the morning. I'll get up. Um, I get up quite early. Um, like my husband gets up to go to work at 4 a.m., um, like three or four days a week. So yeah, he, he gets there quite early. Uh, he owns a gym, so he does personal training. Of course, everyone who wants to train with him has to do it before work. So he's there at 6 a.m. <laughs> yeah. for clients. Um, and so to be honest, the dogs are up. So I end up getting up sometimes four, sometimes five. Um, and to be honest, it's as I get older, I really like that peaceful time in the morning. Um, you know, the kids now are older so they sleep in I have to kind of wake them up for school so the house is quiet for a few hours and that's when I'm most productive I find um, so yeah so in terms of music usually I don't listen to music when I'm designing because I'm so intent on the process and um, for me it really is almost like a meditation too when you're designing like the more I think about it the less it works like I find I end up getting sort of blocked but as soon as I kind of let it go and just let the design kind of come out um, assuming I've done all that pre-work right like I write notes, I do little sketches, I do, um, you know, I've kind of thought about it a little bit for, for a day or two. And then by the time I finally sit down with those things, I find the design generally comes out pretty quickly. Um, but it's, I really have to kind of like get my brain out of there and just let the process happen. I don't know if, if you find that in, in your own designing or. I think that my life, because my kids are three and one. So there's that for a start. I mean, a lot of the process is different That's than right. for me. I've, I've got a little bit of tinnitus as well. So I don't really like silence because I just get this funny little hissing noise in the back of my head all the time. So depending on the type of work I'm doing, I will listen to certain types of music. Um, if, it's, if it's like emails and stuff, then I tend to go for sort of drum and bass and quite lively dance music. But then if it's something a bit more creative, I might slip to something more like lo-fi and kind of chilled or something like that. But I usually need something on it. Yeah, yeah. But the one thing that was interesting yeah. that I was thinking about what you're saying there, I've been listening to Seth Godin's latest audio book. I don't know if you know Seth Godin. No. Um, he wrote, he's written loads of books. Um, he's a kind of, he started out in marketing, but basically he just writes a blog and every day comes out with just really great insights about marketing and creativity and productivity. And his latest book's called The Practice. And there's, there's something he talks about where there's a difference between self-confidence which can often result in hubris which can be a bit of an error or sort of trust in the process and from what you've said to me it sounds like you know that if you do all that pre-work and when the time comes you can sit down and just trust in your own creative process that this stuff will yeah. kind of come out yeah I, th I think that's the case uh, I've, I've heard similar things that you know like pro athletes or or professional uh, musicians um, you know, you get to a point where you've done something like 10,000 hours of practice, right, of work, of putting it all in. And then at that point, you know, 10,000 or whatever number, yeah. um, you, you are just submerged in the process. And um, I, think that's, I think that's really true. Um, I mean, and, and I'm certainly not like that with many things in my life, but, um, but I think I am at a point where that artistic process works better for me now when I'm not thinking too hard about it. And you know, of course now and again, I still come up against a block, um, you know, when, when the idea just won't flow. And sometimes, I mean, we all end up with, I'm sure times in our lives where you feel less creative than others, but um, you know, and then I start 
I'm a bit of a worrier. So I'll start thinking, Oh my goodness, I'm never, never going to design again. You know? And of course <laughs> I overreact, but, but then a couple of days later, you know, um, I'll think, okay, I'm just, I'm going to put it aside for a couple of days and it's just not ready to come out and I'll do other things. That's when I, I like to do the business side of things. I'll mm. take care of the, the finishing stuff or the photo, you know, the photography and those kinds of things. And I think that's why it's good to have many hats because to be honest, the creative side of you can get burnt out. And I think that's what happens. You have, you have this creative flow. And for me, it's usually, you know, a couple days in a row, I'll get a bunch of stuff done. And then, um, and then I'll run up against a wall where I think, okay, I, that's, that's it for now. I do need to step away and do some other stuff. And then I, I find it just comes back a couple days later. I'll think, oh yeah, I think it's time to sit down and design. And then that one that I was having problems with will just come out. Um, so it does, it does seem like there's a, there's a natural flow that if I try to force it, or push against it, it, it's it's harder to design than if it just let it happen. You have to have a bit um, of faith in yourself, don't you, to know that that happens. But it's definitely true that if you let the front part of your brain deal with something else, like you say, a bit of marketing, a bit of this, a bit of that, the, the yeah. back of your brain will just m sort it all out if you give it a chance. Yeah, I think I think that's what happens. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that sounds that's you know that sounds familiar to me. There's been plenty of times. It, like rather than push at making bad work, just walk away you know, and go and stare yes. at a tree or a cloud. Do you know what I mean? Just do yeah, something absolutely. to take you out of it. Because your ego yes. will just be messing with you after a certain point. Like you say, you'll worry that's, that your design is over. Whereas yeah, that's, that's exactly really what bad. happens. I think that ego part can can definitely cause trouble. I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I do, I don't know if you meditate at all, but I have like a seated practice and I, I've been, you know, sort of getting that sort of spiritual side of me, especially this year after all the craziness mm. that's going on, you know, um, that was one of the reasons why we moved out. I really wanted to be closer to nature and to just have a calmer exterior, um, you know, physical environment to, to kind of let, let all the, the stress go, you know, and it's, it's hard because I think for a lot of people this year has been insane, right? Mm. Uh, you know, we're no exception, but, uh, but yeah, I think the closer you are to nature, I think for me, like you said, you stare at a tree or a cloud or, you know, you sit out in your backyard and, and look at the sky for a couple of minutes. That, that for me kind of clears, uh, clears that the thinking part and, uh, and kind of lets you focus more on the creative side of things. We sort of forget that we're beings of nature sometimes, don't we? We think us humans are like the business, but actually we're just kind of sophisticated animals. I like to look at trees and That's realize true. that the trees are like, they're dropping their leaves. They don't really care who's the president right now. They're trees. As long as nobody cuts them down, they'll be around for like a long time, you know, and that's good. I think that's an important perspective to have. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that we're, we're part of, we're part of the world. Yeah. 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 I've got one more question. It's true. And then I think we're done. Uh, what is your one top tip for somebody who might want to be a cross stitch designer or somebody who is a cross stitch designer? What's your like number one piece of cross stitch designer wisdom? Oh my goodness. Mm. Well, I don't know because there's, there's so many things. Um, okay, just let it flow. Well, well, I think, I, I think we touched on a few. And one I think would be to trust, trust in yourself, trust in the process. And, you know, just really do what you love and don't try to force it. So, you know, um, basically just follow, follow the path as it comes towards you. You know, if you really love designing a certain thing, you just follow it. And then I think, you know, there's a saying, right? You don't have to see the whole set of stairs. You just need the, the next step. So I think those kinds of things will just happen. You don't necessarily, you can plan for the future, of course. And I think having a general business plan is good. But um, for me anyways, I find, you know, things just happen. And then that will open up the next thing for you to do. So I would say just, just do what you love and, and trust in it. It's funny, isn't it? You, can't, you don't have to see the whole stairs. I think sometimes you don't even realize there are stairs until you look back. Like I look back on right. all the different experiences I've had and I'm like, there were some stairs. <laughs> Didn't even see it. Yeah, I'm the same way. Yeah, you think you, you do something because you think, oh, this could be fun. And then those kinds of things add up until you look back and you think, wow, you know, like I guess we started around the same time, right? So now it's been, what, 12, 12 13 years for us doing, yeah. doing this kind of thing. And, uh, and I wouldn't have dreamed of it, honestly. I, I never expected to be a cross-stitch designer. I'm, I'm so thankful and grateful that this is what I do, but it wasn't something that I had planned for myself. It just, it just happened. And, um, 
you know, and you just embrace that, I guess. <laughs> well, do, when people, I mean, are there people like that? Well, right. So sometimes I think if I ever did a school reunion and I had to explain to the people I went to school with what I do now, oh. some of them I think would understand oh and some of them would not have a clue. But I mean, how do you, how do you cope with that? What do you say to people? What do they think? I, I'm always a little embarrassed because well, I'll gauge the situation. Sometimes I tell people I'm just a graphic designer if I don't feel like getting into it at all. Mm. And people know what that is. And it's not totally off base. But sometimes they'll say, oh, I'm a cross-stitch cross designer. And often I get, what? Or, oh, <laughs> I didn't know that was a job. You know, like you get these kind of responses. Um, and I just say, yeah, it is. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a thing. <laughs> but, uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't often elaborate unless somebody does seem interested because I'll get like, oh, my aunt does that or, oh, you know, my sister does that. And then I'll, I'll say, oh, well, you know, you can, they can check out my website if you want. But um, unless somebody really jumps on it, I don't, I don't often elaborate. But, do you ever have um, that thing where you go, What, what do you find? When well, what I was going to say is, do you ever get that thing where you go, I'm a cross-stitch designer and someone goes, oh, I love knitting. And you're like, well, that's going oh, well. Yes. <laughs> That's Thank right, yeah, yeah, crochet or whatever, yeah, okay, yeah. It's not mine's, totally out of, out of the realm, but... I suppose mine's a bit different because I don't, you know, quite comfortably, I don't say I'm a cross-stitch designer now because I just don't design any cross-stitch, but I'm more like a sort of, for a long time I've been a sort of curator, I guess, that's the way I prefer yeah. to describe things because I like bring things together. It's the same with the mag, you know, it's just curate a bunch of stuff in a certain direction, so sometimes I just say I'm yeah. a craft phenomenon because I feel like that's suitably woolly. <laughs> just a phenomenon it's just that's how it that's is. right <laughs> it kind of works that's awesome um, <laughs> just to wrap things up on such a humble note such a humble note um, <laughs> where, where can people find you online if it wasn't already obvious yes well uh so my website for sure is where you can see my work and um and, and buy it uh that's tinymodernist.com of course, uh, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, all Tiny Modernist. You can Google it or whatever. Um, those are probably the best places. And uh, if you want to sign up for the newsletter, that, you can do that from the website as well. Um, yeah, it's, I'm around. You can just Google it. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate you being my third designer discourse. It has been yeah. a pleasure. Well, that was a great video, don't you think? Cheryl's got so much talent. She's such a lovely person. I really feel when you talk to her, she's just a really grounded person. You know, you feel like it's someone you can rely on. She's just lovely. You know, she's just a really nice person. She's got a great design approach. She clearly knows what she's doing. She knows what her business is about. And yeah, I just really enjoyed it. It was really great to talk with her. There was a lot that we had in common and a lot of similar interests and stuff. So I hope that you enjoyed it as well. Don't forget that there are many more Designer Discourse videos in the Designer Discourse playlist, which is linked here, there, somewhere. And uh, if you'd like to leave a comment, let me know what you think of the conversation. Let me know if there are any other designers that you would like me to discourse with in the future. I've got plenty more planned and I hope you'll be around to enjoy them. So thanks for your time. Give us a like if you feel like it. If you haven't subscribed already, then I think you should because, hey, it's worth it. And I'll see you for the next video. Take care of yourselves. Happy stitching, everyone.